Good morning, and we're so glad again that you could join us on this Easter Sunday. Uh, it is, again, a little bit different than how we've been worshiping before, but we're so glad that you can join us by this means. Uh, it's not the way we would prefer to worship. Uh, we'd love to have you here and, and have a full sanctuary as we come to worship on this Easter Sunday, but we're just grateful that we can be able to, to share with you uh, on this special day. Uh, perhaps you've read recently uh, about all around the world there will be empty sanctuaries today. But uh, as the saying goes, we can relax, we can rejoice because the tomb is still empty as well. Easter may be a, a little bit different today, but the good thing is we still worship a risen Savior. And we can celebrate that today. That does not change today or tomorrow or for all time. So we're glad that you're here to worship with us today. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for this very special day that we celebrate, but a day that we should celebrate every day. We thank you for your, your life. We thank you for your death and your sacrifice on the cross, for your covering our sins through your death. But Lord, we thank you that you were raised to new life just as we are raised to new life in our relationship with you. Lord, thank you for being with us here today, even in an empty sanctuary. We sense your presence. We thank you for that. And we pray that in these days ahead, you will use us in, in very different ways to minister to our world around us. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And Lord, we thank you that we can celebrate today because of who you are. And it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom. I am so thankful for all that uh, Tom is doing and how the Lord is using him and uh, in the life of this church. I appreciate all he does to, to help care for the families and to continue to reach out uh, to them during this time. When I was listening to him uh, share what he did about the empty churches and the empty tomb, I, it made me think about the fact that how much this day, Easter Sunday, is such a, a day of hope. And I can only imagine... Uh, what it was like for those early disciples as they, um, as they encountered the fact that Jesus was dead, he was buried, it seemed hopeless, it seemed like that everything was over, and, and yet on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, uh, Jesus was raised from the dead, and what hope and encouragement that had uh, to bring to them. And so the same is true for us today in the midst of, of crisis and difficulty to just have the, the confident assurance that we have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. And we want to talk about that today. Our text this morning is going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you'll find that in your Bibles, it'll take us a few minutes to get there, but we will ultimately uh, get to that passage of Scripture in, in just a moment. So we have been talking about connecting the dots. And this morning we have one more dot that we want to connect to and that we want to pull all of this together. Uh, so far we have talked about the what of this great salvation that God has given to us, that He rescued us, that He redeemed us, that He restored us into a relationship with the Father. And, and we looked last Sunday that this is this awesome, what great a salvation uh, that God has given to us. And then on Good Friday night, uh, we talked about how God accomplished that, how through the, the death of Jesus, the giving of his life, and the pouring out of his blood, he said, that was the new covenant in his blood. And we saw how that is a, a symbol and a sign of the sacrifice that Jesus uh, did, that he accomplished through, through the giving of his life to provide forgiveness of our sins. And so what God did in restoring us and rescuing us and redeeming us is only possible because of what and how God did it through His Son, Jesus. Well, there's one more piece to this puzzle. Because when I think about, uh, when I think about this great salvation that God has given to us and begin to think about how He's restored us into His family, He redeemed us and rescued us from the, the power of Satan, and He gave us the forgiveness of our of our sins and the guilt of our sins so that that's no longer something that weighs heavy on us. I, I think about that and I think, man, that is almost, that's just too far-fetched to believe. In fact, we could even ask ourselves, is it actually possible? And if it is possible, how can I be certain of that? How can I actually know 
that what God has said that he has done through his son Jesus, how is it possible that that could happen and how can we have certainty about that? Well, that's the last dot. And that's what I want to connect to this morning and to help you uh, to understand that. And just like we have said in the previous messages, that as you put all of this together and you begin to connect all of these dots together, what happens is, is that a picture that was not very clear to begin with begins to emerge. And we begin to see it in all, in all of its beauty. Well, Easter Sunday, as I said a moment ago, is about the resurrection of Jesus And my point is that it is because of the resurrection of Jesus. It is what happened when God raised him from the dead that gives us the certainty and the assurance and the promise that what God did and how he did it is something that actually took place and that we can have certainty about it. You may remember if you listen to the message on on Good Friday, you may remember that I pointed out that there were four different references in the Gospels, where Jesus talked about the sequence of events that were going to take place. He said things like, we're going to Jerusalem. When we are there, he said, I will be arrested. I will be delivered up into the hands of evil men. They will deliver me over to the Gentiles, he said, who will who will mock me, who will flog me, who will ultimately crucify me and kill me. And in all four of those passages that scattered throughout at different points of time in Jesus' life, scattered throughout the Gospel of Matthew, what you find is that the very last of the sequence that Jesus said was that he said every time, with the exception of Matthew 26, verse 2, every time he said to them, they will kill me, I will be crucified, but I will be raised from the dead. Now, I want you just to think about that for just a moment. It was something that I don't think really registered with uh, the disciples when he was saying that to them. And I can understand that. I mean, if this person that, that I have loved and followed and, and literally have just put everything into hearing of what he's saying and following what he's teaching and, and what he's doing, and then to begin to hear him to say, we're going to Jerusalem where I'm going to ultimately be crucified, my mind would be, well, let's don't go to Jerusalem then. Because I want you to avoid that. I don't want you to die. But what they didn't realize is that the purpose and the plan of what God had in that, that had to be accomplished. And so I can only imagine that what what they heard, the main thing that they heard was that he's going to be crucified and the cruel death that he would ultimately die because of that. And they totally missed the very last statement. In fact, in Luke's gospel... Luke tells us that the women were going to the, the grave on the, after, the, after Jesus had been buried and after the Sabbath day, on the first day of the week, early in the morning, they get up to go to the tomb of Jesus because they were going to finish the preparation of his body for death. And as they're walking, Luke says they are, they are discussing, they're discussing, well, who's going to roll the stone away? Who's going to move it out of the way? Well, when they arrive at the tomb, what they find is that the stone has already been rolled away. And when they look inside, Jesus is not there. And there are two angels that appear to them. And the angel says to them, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here, they said. He has risen. He said, just like he told you. In other words, they were saying, just like he had said to you all of those other times, that he was going to be raised from the dead It was like, don't you remember that? Don't you remember what he said? And for whatever reason, it did not register with them. Well, it's this last detail where Jesus said in that sequence of events that he would be raised from the dead. It is this last detail that gives us the significance and the the certainty and the assurance that what God did in this great salvation that he spoke of, that we looked at in in Colossians chapter 1, this great salvation that what God did in that and how he did it through Jesus is an actual fact and a certainty and something that we can be assured of. In other words, because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, It indicates that his sacrifice was sufficient and acceptable by God. And it tells us then that what happened was that forgiveness is possible. That's what we saw in the Good Friday service. That forgiveness is possible. 
And because forgiveness is possible, then we have been rescued from the authority of darkness and the power of Satan, and we have been restored into a relationship with God, and we have been qualified to share in the inheritance with the saints in light. And what that does for us is, it's just telling us that what God did through Jesus, that the resurrection is the assurance that every bit of that was actually so. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to use several passages. Ultimately, we're going to get to 1 Corinthians 15. But I want to show you how we can have certainty about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead because that is the key and the proof and the evidence that everything that God said he would do is what he actually did. And so when I look at 1 Corinthians 15 in just a moment and some other verses, what I find is, is that there are three specific evidences that are there for us that give us the assurance that we can absolutely know that Jesus was raised from the dead. The first of those is that we have the prophetic word that he would be raised. In fact, Psalm 16, verse 9 through 10 reads like this. The psalmist said, I have set the Lord continually before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, David is writing that. But when you come to Acts chapter 2 and Peter is preaching that first message on the day of Pentecost, which is after Jesus, 50 days after Jesus had been raised from the dead, Peter says this in Acts chapter 2, verse 24 through 27. He says, But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, and what Peter is saying is that what David said in Psalm 16, 9 and 10, that David was not actually talking about himself, but rather he was talking about the Messiah, the Savior, ultimately Jesus. In verse 25, Peter said, For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue praised or exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And so what Peter is doing on that sermon on the day of Pentecost when he's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus and then ultimately it wasn't just about Jesus dying but he moved from the death of Jesus and he began to talk about the resurrection and he said, God raised him from the dead. And Peter, just like we've been doing, Peter is connecting the dots where he is saying that the prophetic word of the Old Testament, one passage in particular in Psalm 16, is a passage that tells us that Jesus ultimately would be raised from the dead. You say, well, how does that, how does that give us assurance? Well, when I think about all of the other passages in the, New, in the Old Testament that talk about the coming of Jesus, where he would be born, how he would live, what he would do, and about his death. And all of those things came to pass. All of those prophetic words were fulfilled. Then what that tells me is, why can't I believe this prophetic word? Why isn't this word true? And absolutely it is. And this word, found in the Old Testament, proclaimed by Peter is assurance to us and evidence to us that Jesus was actually raised from the dead. But it doesn't end there. The second evidence is that you have Jesus' own word that he would be raised from the dead. I mentioned to you just earlier that more than three times he talked about, Jesus did, talked about his death, and then he immediately followed it by saying, and I will be raised from the dead and I will be raised from the dead. And so when I think about all of those sequences of events, from being arrested, from being beaten, from being mocked, from being crucified, everything that was given in that sequence of events, every bit of that happened just like Jesus said that it would. My conclusion is, so why wouldn't I then take what he said about his being raised from the dead 
as true as well. You, can, you have his word on it. He didn't lie. It wasn't made up. It wasn't make-believe. It was actually what happened, and you have his very word on it. And that just gives me assurance. I see so many connections like that. I remember, I remember a few Christmases ago reading the Christmas story and, and hearing the angels as they talked about the, the prophetic word of the birth of the Messiah, the birth of the Savior of Jesus. And then the angel said to the shepherd, said, and you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. It was a word that had never been prophesied in the Old Testament. And when the shepherds got to where they found the baby Jesus, they found him just like the angels had said that they would. And what that tells me is, if that was so, then so is everything else that was said about him and that would be said about him. And I apply that same reasoning to, to this passage here. If everything else that was said, that Jesus said would happen to him, if that happened, then I can be assured that his being raised from the dead is something that actually, truthfully happened as well. And therefore it is evidence to us. But it didn't stop there. It was not only the prophetic word that we have on it, not only the word of Jesus, what he said about it, but you also have the eyewitnesses who said that they saw Jesus raised from the dead. Listen to these words in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes, clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the, wom to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. And so you have these two women who come to the tomb on that early Sunday morning and what they find is the stone rolled away, the, the tomb empty, and they go and they begin to report what had happened. In Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 24, Luke tells about the occasion of two disciples on the road to Emmaus who had an encounter with Jesus, didn't even realize it was Jesus that had, had joined them on this journey but then they ultimately recognized who he was and saw him for who he was as the risen Messiah. But look at 1 Corinthians 15, because there we have one of the most thorough accounts of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus being raised from the dead. It wasn't just the women. It wasn't just the two disciples. Listen to what Paul said uh, beginning in chapter 15 and, and verse 4. Let's start there. It says, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, that is that they have died. And then he appeared to James, and if you read the Gospels, James was not present on that Sunday night when Jesus appeared in that upper room to the most of the disciples, but he appeared to them again, and James was present later. And so James sort of had his own personal encounter with Jesus, the risen Jesus. And then verse 8, Paul said, And last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. And so what you have is, is that you have not only just a couple of women who said, We saw him alive. And not just two disciples on the road to Emmaus, but you have Peter and James and you have the apostles and you have, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, you have at one time more than 500 people at one time who saw the risen Christ. He was raised from the dead. And then Paul said, as one untimely born, he said, I myself have encountered him. I have seen the risen Christ. 
And so it's not only the prophetic word that gives us evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead, and it's not only Jesus' own words himself that he would be raised from the dead, but you have actual individuals who saw him, who talked with him, who touched him, who actually saw him alive. Now the significance of that is, and you see it here in 1 Corinthians 15, is that Paul is saying that all of this assurance about the resurrection of Jesus, and particularly the eyewitnesses, Paul is building a case that the resurrection of Jesus is the reason that we have hope, the reason that we have assurance, and that we have certainty that everything that God said He did in salvation through Jesus Christ, that every bit of that we can be certain of. And it all hinges on this one event in the life of Jesus, and that is His resurrection. And so think about this with me for just a minute. When I look at, and I didn't read it, but if you begin in in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I delivered to you what was given to me. And then in verse 3 he says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that he was raised the third day. That sounds just like, with with few exceptions, that sounds just like the sequence of events that Jesus gave in the Gospels. But Paul added one more detail. It wasn't just that he was arrested and beaten and crucified and mocked and all of those things and buried and raised the third day. Paul added one more detail. He said, and he appeared. And so everything that he said here, according to Scripture, according to the purpose and the plan of God that he would do through his son Jesus. In fact, there's in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, when, when Peter is preaching that sermon, when he talks about the crucifixion of Jesus, he does not say that it was evil men who delivered Jesus up to be crucified. In fact, in Acts 2.23, Peter says it was God who, who, according to his own predetermined plan, delivered up his son, his only son, to be crucified, to be the sacrifice for the sin of mankind, that there might be forgiveness. And so every bit of it is according to Scripture and according to the purpose of plan of God. And what Paul is saying is, is that with the resurrection of Jesus, what you have is the certainty, the absolute proof that what God did through Jesus is actually what he accomplished. Now, when I look at what I look at what Paul begins to do in this 1 Corinthians passage, what I realize is is that Paul is giving us two reasons. Two reasons that the about the significance of the of the resurrection and the appearing of Jesus. Let me let me show you that within this text. The first reason is this The fact that people saw Jesus alive verifies that he was raised from the dead. It wasn't something that was made up. It was something that was testified to by, according to Paul, by over 500 people at one time. In fact, you may be aware that in a court of law that a matter is confirmed on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so if you had two or three people who said, yes, this is true, then that is the confirmation of that word, of that testimony, of the witness of those individuals. Well, what Paul's doing here is that Paul is saying it wasn't just one or two. It was well over 500 people who are verifying that they have seen the crucified, resurrected Jesus, that they have actually seen him alive. And what Paul is saying is, how do I know that it's certain? Well, he's in that group that testified, but he said it is verified on the testimony of all of these witnesses who actually have seen him alive. And not just seen him alive, but who have, that he has appeared to. Now, in the context here, in 1 Corinthians 15, what Paul is doing is, is that there were some within the church at Corinth who were saying, who was saying, there is no resurrection of the dead. And Paul is like, wait a minute, you need to be careful about what you're saying. 
Because if you are saying that there is no resurrection of the dead, then what you are saying is, is that Jesus himself was not resurrected either. And he'll go on in just a minute and say, and if Jesus was not resurrected, then you need to consider what all the implications are of that. Well, so what he's doing is he's saying, I want you to understand that all of these witnesses have given testimony to the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12 and following. What Paul begins to do is he moves from just that first reason about the appearance of Jesus and the significance of that, that it verifies the resurrection of Jesus. The second reason that he gives in this is that it validates what God said he would do through the actual death and crucifixion of Jesus. Look at verse 12, if you will, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And Paul says this. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ, and here's the argument, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worth, worthless, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now, everything that Paul is saying and I want you to hear this. Everything that Paul is saying about what God did and how he did it through his son Jesus hinges on whether Jesus was raised from the dead or not. And so Paul, as he's dealing with those who were saying there is no resurrection, what he is in fact doing is that he is laying a foundation for us that helps us have certainty because he's going to say, no, Christ has been raised from the dead. How do we know? It's verified by over 500 witnesses. What's the significance of that? Why is that so important? Because it validates, it is proof that what God said that he would do, he would actually accomplish and he would do it through his son, Jesus. Now, obviously, Paul in verses 12 and following is arguing from the negative. And so he is building his case by saying, if Christ has not been raised, then this is what you can be assured of. This is what you can know. First, he says that our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. He said we are actually found to be liars because we are proclaiming that Jesus was raised from the dead when in fact he was not raised if the dead are not raised. And then he said this, if Christ has not been raised, he said your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Now I want you to think about that for just a moment. Because this is Paul's, this is Paul's reasoning, and, and this is where, this is where we, we put the dots together. Because if you remember in Colossians chapter 1, where he listed this great work of salvation that God has done, the very last thing he said was that in his beloved Son, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. When we talked about how he accomplished that, Jesus said on the night that he instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples and he took the cup and he said, drink it. He said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out, which is sacrificed for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And the way that we know that what Jesus did through his death actually was what God wanted to accomplish on our behalf in the forgiveness of our sins and everything else that is in this great salvation. It is only validated and verified as Jesus is raised from the dead. And so the implication is this. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then we would still be in our sins. 
And if we are still in our sins, do you know what that means? It means that we have never been. There is no being rescued from the domain and the power of Satan. There is no being transferred to the kingdom of His beloved Son. And there is no being qualified to share in an inheritance if we have never been forgiven of our sin. But Paul goes on. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, he says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. And what Paul is what Paul is saying is it isn't that he that there is no resurrection, it isn't that Christ was not raised. He says he absolutely was raised from the dead. Over 500 people verify that. And what that ultimately means is it validates the fact that what God did through the death of his son was an actual reality. It actually is true. And we have certainty on it because of the resurrection of the dead. That Jesus' death paid the penalty of our sin, took the guilt of our sin upon Himself, that we might be forgiven. And the very fact that God, that God raised Him from the dead proves that the sacrifice of Jesus for the sin of mankind, mankind, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus for man's sin was sufficient to take care of our sin. And God raised him from the dead as evidence and proof that that was actually what took place. In fact, Paul said this in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He said, he was delivered up because of our transgressions, because of our sins. Meaning, He was crucified. He was placed on the cross. He died that cruel death on the cross, taking the judgment of God upon himself. He was delivered up for our transgressions. And then he said this, Romans 4, 25, and he was raised again for our justification. In other words, he was raised proving that what he did in being delivered up was sufficient. And the end result is that God is now able to justify us. You remember that word? It's a word that Sunday a week ago, when we talked about this great salvation, I made reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, where Paul said, you know the unrighteous are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he listed all these different kinds of sin and unrighteousness. And then you come to verse 11, where he says, and such were some of you. How is it that we no longer are considered unrighteous? How is it that our sin is forgiven, that God has has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west, and He remembers them no, no more? How is that possible? Well, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11, he says, that's what you were, but you were washed. Meaning that this, this filth of sin is cleansed. We have been washed. And he says, you have been sanctified. Because your sin has been washed away, you have been declared holy. You have been declared sanctified before God. Sin is no longer no longer held and counted to you, to your charge. And then he said, not only were you washed and you were sanctified, but then he says this, but you were justified. Meaning, it's a legal term, meaning you were put in a right relationship with God. Meaning that your sin has been forgiven. The guilt has been removed. And God has restored you to a relationship with Himself. And as I like to say, because I've heard it said somewhere before, and it is so accurate, He said that when God justifies us, it is now that He looks at us just as if we had never sinned. See, that's the, that's the significance of this. And so He was delivered up for our transgressions, and He was raised again. For our justification, that we might be put in a right relationship with God. And do you know what that means? Connect the dots. What it means is, just by fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, it means that we can be redeemed, the guilt of our sin forgiven. It means that we are rescued, that we have been delivered from the domain and the authority and the power of sin and Satan and darkness, and we have been transferred to the kingdom of His beloved Son. And it means that He has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. And as I said on Good Friday, when He brought us into His kingdom, 
We did not come into his kingdom as subjects of God. We came into his kingdom as sons. And as such, he has qualified us to share in this amazing inheritance that is ours through Jesus Christ. And so this is the great salvation that God has done for us. He accomplished it through the death of his son Jesus on the cross. And we can know it's not far-fetched. It's not too good to be true. It is actually something that we can be certain of and assured of. And how? Because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I probably say this every, every Easter. It's just, it's just something ingrained in my mind. In 1986, I had the privilege to go to, to Israel uh, with a class from my seminary in New Orleans. And I remember going to the garden where the place where Jesus was buried, the tomb, and walking in, and it's empty. And when I turned around to walk out the door above the opening where you're going outside, leaving the tomb, it just simply says, He is not here. He is risen. And I'm telling you, what that does for us is that that gives us such hope. Hope for what? Redemption to be rescued, and to be restored in a relationship with God. Now, what I've tried to do over these three messages, what I've tried to do is to help you see this beautiful picture of this great salvation that God has provided through His Son, Jesus, that we can be absolutely certain of. But I hope that it's more than just a picture. I hope for you it's more than just something that is, that is amazing. I hope that it is your personal experience. Because it's not just Easter and Good Friday and all that. It's not just a religious holiday to be observed. It is actually what God did through His Son Jesus so that we could have eternal life, that we could have a relationship with God, that we could have hope in the midst of a situation like what we find ourselves in. Hope beyond this life. And I hope that that is the personal experience in your life. And there's only one way that that becomes a reality. The only way that it happens is, is that you acknowledge and admit. You understand, as God shows you through His Word in the Gospel, that you understand your own brokenness and your own sin and your need for a Savior. And I believe if you've, if you've been listening to these messages, I can't help but believe that God has taken His Word and helped you to understand that that sin that Jesus died for on the cross, that it's your sin. And I hope that, that as God has shown you that, that at the same time you have realized that there is hope. You're helpless to do anything about it in and of yourself. But I hope that you realize that what the Bible teaches is that there is hope, and that hope is through Jesus. And what He says, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have the everlasting life. That if we confess with our mouth, if we believe in our heart, if we acknowledge our sin and acknowledge that Jesus is the only way, that He is the Savior and the Messiah, and we call out to Him in prayer, just asking Him to forgive us and cleanse us, God promises that if we do, that He will save us. And what does that look like? It means that He washes you clean. It means that He sanctifies you and makes you holy. It means that He justifies you resulting in the forgiveness of your sin, you are redeemed. Meaning that you have been rescued from the power of sin and Satan. It means that you have been restored into a relationship with God where you are, as sons, qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And I hope that is your experience. And if it has not been up to this point, I hope that even this morning, that you, right where you are now, that you will call upon the name of the Lord, confessing your sin, repenting of your sin, and asking God to do in you what you can't do for yourself, which is to forgive you that you might experience salvation. I hope that even now, right now, if, you're, if that's where you are, that you will call out to the Lord and that you will be saved. For those of us that have experienced that all, all, already, I pray that today is a great day of celebration as we just reflect on what God has done for us through Jesus Christ and the hope that that gives to us. Let's pray together. Father, I, I am so thankful, Lord, so thankful for this great salvation that you have given to us. It is so 
great a salvation. Lord, who could even fathom that you would come to us in our sin and our wickedness and unrighteousness that, Lord, you would come to us and love us so much that you would take that which is most precious to you in your one and only Son. And, Lord, you would give him to hang on a cross and take the wrath and the judgment of a holy God on sin, that he would take it upon himself, and he had no sin, and that he would take that upon himself and die in our place under the judgment and the condemnation of God. And Lord, you would accept his sacrifice for sin as sufficient. And you would raise him from the dead to prove that. And Lord, then you would make it possible that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, thank you so much for that so great a salvation. Lord, I know that there are people watching this right now that have never trusted in you as their Lord and Savior. And I pray that even right now, Lord, that you would help them to see their need and to call upon the name of the Lord in faith and repentance. And God, that you would save them as you have promised. I pray, Father, they would do that now. And Lord, you would do the work that only you can do. Lord, I just praise you. I praise you, Father, for the good news of hope through Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that, that as believers in this world, regardless of what goes on around us, what is unchanging is the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, is the help from the powerful Holy Spirit within us. And I pray, Father, that as your witnesses in this world, God, that we would be that witness to this great salvation that others can know it as well. And may it be to your honor and to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.